Well, thank you everybody uh, for joining us. Um, I think we're ready to get underway. Um, uh, Hannah, do you want to take down the the uh, the opening screen? Great, thank you. All right, well, uh, hello everyone and uh, and welcome. It's so great that you could be here and, and join us for this really special event and uh, we're really happy about it. Uh, I'm Michael Donahue, I'm the director of the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies, or YIBS. And YIBS is co-hosting this event with the Peabody Museum of Natural History. Uh, and the director of the Peabody is here with us as well, David Skelly. And uh, Dave is gonna handle the back end of this presentation with the handling the question and answer session. And for that purpose, you should use the question and answer function uh, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So please do weigh in with uh, questions and stuff as uh, even as we go along. And Dave will handle that uh, part of the thing at the end. Um, so let me begin by saying a few words of introduction about our speaker, Scott Edwards. So uh, Scott, as I've recently learned, was born in Hawaii, but actually spent much of his childhood uh, in New York in the Bronx. And uh, he eventually ended up as an undergraduate student at Harvard University where he got his degree in 1986. And then uh, after that, he went to uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, where he got his PhD in uh, 1992. Then he spent a couple of years as a postdoc at the University of Florida before he started on the faculty at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle in the zoology department, but also uh, as a curator in the Burke Museum out there. Um, and uh, it wasn't until 2003 that he moved to his present position uh, at Harvard, where he's the Alexander Agassiz Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, and also the Curator of Ornithology in, the, in uh, Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, he has, is a, he's a very famous person, as, as you might imagine, and he recently, well, in 2015, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and just this year he was elected as a member of the American Philosophical Society, which is, which is a great honor. Um, he, uh, uh, about his science, just a little bit, he's a world leading ornithologist, a person who studies birds. And uh, he's also uh, been a leader in the, in the development of the field that we now call phylogenomics. And in particular, he brings a kind of population genetics background to this area and has been uh, really important in uh, shifting the field towards the use of what we call coalescent models in this area. That's a little too much to go into right now, but suffice it to say, it was a major shift in, uh, in our thinking about how to do this kind of work. Um, he's also a leader in the area of STEM education and outreach, and especially sort of expanding the diversity uh, of participation in STEM uh, disciplines and has started a number of programs that are really uh, fantastic. Uh, so, so he's a leader on a bunch of fronts. Uh, suffice it to say, overall, I, he is, as we say in the business, a superstar. Uh, or a rock star, I guess you'd say, and uh, uh, not to mention uh, being a really, you know, special human being. So, uh, Scott, we're really thrilled and honored that you could be with us today to give us a, a seminar. And, uh, and with that, uh, please go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thanks also to uh, Dave Skelly and all the folks who helped set up this event. Um, yeah, I, I remember when uh, Michael and Dave emailed me when I was still on the road this summer. And, um, you know, I was kind of dreading going back to the routine of uh, university life, uh, what's, what seemed routine once I was out there on the road. Anyway, um, I'm glad that you twisted my arm to do this. I think it's going to be a wonderful evening. Um, and I'm particularly excited to tell you about something other than my normal academic pursuits. Um, science, you know, can be pretty all consuming. And to be able to have the luxury of spending a summer um, just absorbing uh, one's environment uh, while uh, riding a bicycle across the US was really, I feel extremely fortunate. And it, you know, naturally allows you to think expansively about where I myself are going as an individual where our country is going. Um, and I hope to share with you some of those thoughts uh, tonight. 
Big, big hello, just in general, to all my Yale friends out there. It's really, uh, I, I, you've got a great institution. And uh, I, I think it was uh, January 2019 or when I brought, basically brought my entire lab to Yale just to hang out. And uh, we learned so much. And it was great to uh, see the uh, Peabody and the, um, the, the Yibs uh, Institute. That was great. And just to reconnect with all my great friends there. So I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. And I found listening to some of the uh, videos I'll show you, it might be useful to wear headphones. Of course, I was when I was on the road, I was equipped with a mere uh, iPhone. And so, um, yeah, some of the, the, the bird photos are certainly not of uh, publication quality, but I think you'll get a sense of all the cool stuff I saw. And so, yeah, uh, the context of this trip is simply that I, uh, I'm i not uh, a, a superstar cyclist. I did some bike touring recreationally in college. Um, and, you know, I had always dreamed of cycling across the U.S. And the question really was when. And, you know, as all of my uh, usual academic pursuits in the summer got canceled, you know, field work and um, conferences, et cetera, uh, it quickly became clear that this was the summer to do it. And um, so between about uh, in the span of sort of early April to uh, June 6th when I left, I bought a new bicycle, um, got lots of equipment and, uh, and hit the road. And so I hope to tell you about some of the amazing uh, sights and sounds and people I met during the summer. So my route uh, took me from uh, Plum Island, Massachusetts to Portland, uh, Oregon, and uh, at the coast at Seaside, Oregon, um, Sunset Beach, and spanning a total of 3,800 miles in about, in about 76 days. And, um, you know, I had heard from all of my cycling buddies uh, and non-cycling buddies that uh, I was going the wrong direction. I should go west to east. Uh, their primary justification being the headwinds, which supposedly went uh, inexorably from west to east. And although I did certainly hit some headwinds along the way, for me, the unfolding drama of going from east to west, you know, in the direction in which for better or worse, our continent was colonized from Europe, um, at least one of the directions. Um, I think that unfolding drama for me was much more compelling than any headwinds I might receive. And in fact, I, I'm pretty sure I had as many tailwinds as I did headwinds as well. I should also just mention that I, in planning my route, I used a lot of published maps from the Adventure Cycling Association, which is based in Missoula, Montana. Um, and when stringing together different routes, I, I, I basically used Google apps, uh, Google Maps for bicycle, which proved okay, although, um, yeah, misses a lot of, it's, it's certainly no substitute for local knowledge, which I benefited, fr benefited from uh, quite a lot. So this is my basic setup. Uh, you can see uh, I've got, um, some panniers both in front and back and uh, I was intending to do as much camping as I could so I had a tent and a sleeping pad and a sleeping bag. Uh, in my front panniers I had uh, kept a lot of my food and on the other side we had tools and uh, spare parts for bicycles. I carried a spare tire, uh, multiple um, water bottles and because you know you never know when you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, and you get a flat, you, you've got to fix it on your own. And so um, it was uh, like a little house on wheels, which really uh, gave you a sense of uh, independence um, and um, self-sufficiency. I uh, was fortunate to spend most of my evenings camping. And uh, I did this just because uh, it gave me as much flexibility as I could uh, as I as I could, um, I did spend uh, a few nights in uh, hotels or in this little cabin which you see here in Montana on the bottom. But overall, I tried to camp as much as I could. Um, 
didn't always work out. I definitely uh, got soaked a few times and um, learned the hard way how to keep a prepared camp. But um, uh, it really, for me, was one of the highlights to um, uh, unplug from the urban uh, setting and, uh, and uh, enjoy the, the night sky. And I would naturally uh, choose my campgrounds based on whether they had a, a swimming pool or not. I wasn't any slouch. I was going to, uh, you know, if a, if, a, if a campground didn't have a swimming pool after a long day's ride, that's it. It was out. Uh, either that or uh, an opportunity to dip my feet, uh, as you see I'm doing here in the uh, Madison River in, um, in uh, Montana. Um, getting in the water at the end of each day was absolutely essential. I did roughly 50 to 60 miles each day, and it was a hot summer, and so uh, really made a difference to cool off. Just to give you an, uh, a profile of the elevation, um, starting in the east on the right, um, my first major hurdle were the green mountains of southern uh, Vermont. Um, and then I uh, segued down to the lowlands, sort of just south of Lake Ontario, heading west south of Lake Ontario. Um, I chose to go to Ithaca, New York, which uh, brought me once again into a bunch of hills in central uh, New York. Um, and then uh, came down again, uh, heading into Lake Erie in the flatlands in Ohio. Spent much of the trip in the Midwest um, where the elevation gradually increased, but so gradually it was really imperceptible. Um, and my first really big uh, hills were in the Badlands of South Dakota, as well as the Black Hills uh, of also of South Dakota an offshoot of the Rocky Mountains. I have three major passes in Montana uh, and actually diverted my route quite a bit north uh, from Wyoming simply because the passes were, uh, you know, easier to, to deal with than uh, in Wyoming. Um, but surprisingly, some of my hardest days, the two hardest days were in um, southeast Washington in the Palouse region, where surprisingly, uh, although the absolute elevation was fairly low. The relative elevation and the elevation gained and, the, and the, um, um, the steepness of the terrain was quite a surprise to me. So in, two of my toughest days were in uh, Southeast Washington. Now, uh, being an ornithologist, as Michael mentioned, um, one of my main goals of the trip was just to, to see some cool birds, which I tried to do. And so I'll share with you some of the common birds that I encountered, here's an osprey, um, which was really interesting to see. Uh, uh, surprisingly, ospreys were very skittish. Even when I was on my bicycle, um, they would fly up, be, get all upset, um, uh, even though their nests were, you know, 60 feet up on a pole. Um, I also saw a lot of killdeers, uh, such as you see here in Illinois, um, killdeers are frankly one of the most common species uh, in the Midwest. Um, they have made a home in a lot of the corn fields, the agricultural regions, and so, and I trust me, there's plenty of that habitat um, in uh, the Midwestern states. One of the new birds which I got to know well was uh, a small shorebird called an upland sandpiper. And uh, this is a bird which occurs in Massachusetts, but only very rarely. And uh, it was really great to get to know this species. Um, it's a really bizarre shorebird that um, obviously doesn't live near the shore. And it uh, has a really distinctive flight and call. And uh, it was nice to be able to see this bird over and over again and thereby get to know its habits uh, and its call. Most of the birding, as you can imagine, I did was by ear. And so you can see here I am in uh, South Dakota. You might have heard that chipping sparrow in the background. I would, I'm fortunate enough to be good enough at identifying a lot of birds by ear that I could identify them uh, primarily as I cruised. I didn't have to stop um, every time I wanted to bird watch. And the truth of it is, um, 
sadly, perhaps, I really didn't have the time to take a relaxed bird walk every morning. It was pretty much get up, start riding again. On the right here, you see some uh, Western sea birds, which are, um, it was really one of the first species I encountered. It's documented in my, my uh, progress to the West. It was really one of the genuinely first, genuinely Western species, uh, which was really exciting for me. The West really began to open up when I uh, started in um, Wyoming. That was, for me, psychologically, really kind of the most Western, the first Western state. And I was able to see things like uh, pronghorns, like you see here. Uh, there's a uh, white-tailed deer. Um, this is all on a, a private ranch I was able to visit. And also things like uh, sandhill uh, uh, swallows, which, um, turns out nest in great abundance in our uh, nation's bridges. So pretty much every bridge that spans a river, however small, has a few swallows nests. And um, it was, uh, I, in that respect, really their habitat for this particular group of birds has probably increased over time. Uh, here's a shot of some uh, sandhill cranes, a very majestic species. Um, found throughout the Midwest. And um, you can see them flying low in the background there uh, against the uh, Bighorn Mountains, again in uh, Wyoming. And one of the really interesting habitats, which I really encountered for the first time, was that of the so-called potholes, uh, which are these uh, isolated lakes in South Dakota and other parts of the Midwest. There you see some white-faced ibis. Here you see a black tern, which is a, a, a species of inland tern that lives uh, in uh, these potholes. And it was a really exciting habitat. You know, I think um, uh, potholes are one of these habitats that um, could easily have be filled in and essentially uh, bulldozed over, especially with all the agricultural land around them. And thankfully, some patches of them have survived. Another really exciting spot I hit was the Badlands National Park in South Dakota. And um, it was almost like clockwork. You can hear the prairie dog there. As soon as I crossed into the borders of this park, there was buffalo, there was pronghorn, and there were things like prairie dogs and this really amazing uh, burrowing owl, which you see right here. And it truly drove home how important our national parks are for as habitat for uh, endangered species. Now, sadly, most of the species I saw, many of them were dead on the road. And, um, you know, traveling on bicycle, you see firsthand, uh, sometimes in real time, just how deadly cars can be uh, for our uh, avian uh, friends. Um, it's, you know, um, it's one of the, the un, unappreciated sources of mortality for many of our birds. Uh, and many people driving cars, I'm convinced, aren't aware that they even hit a bird um, just because they're often so small and uh, there's basically very little sound when you do hit them. Um, these birds came from a variety of species uh, and um, yeah, it was sort of a daily reminder of just the carnage. Uh, my, the curator in me really wanted to pick these up and bring them to a local museum. But of course, uh, I, I didn't have the permits to do that, uh, nor, nor the time really. <clears throat> Rivers for me were a really uh, significant, marked really significant milestones. And uh, not only were they beautiful in their own right, but they really uh, mark your progress in a very natural, intuitive way. And so here's some of the great rivers that I crossed uh, in the first uh, half of the uh, journey. Um, and I have to say the Missouri River, uh, for me, hands down, is way, way prettier than the uh, Mississippi River. Some of the Western rivers, which I enjoyed, you see here, and, and increasingly these rivers started to take on uh, really important um, stories in their history. 
And so, of course, Little Bighorn River was near where um, Custer was uh, defeated uh, by the Crow and other Indians um, back in the 1850s. Uh, and of course, the Yellowstone River was uh, traveled along uh, for several weeks by Lewis and Clark back in the 1804 to 1806. And the Columbia River, of course, um, just such a interesting and very stark landscape um, played huge, uh, really important history in the Western United States. And the Clearwater River, which you see in the lower left, is uh, one of the best uh, steelhead uh, fishing rivers in the country. Uh, sadly, some of those runs have declined in recent years. So just take in for a moment this amazing panorama of the Yellowstone River. Um, it's just incredible, the numerous camping spots all through the West that most cars uh, just uh, whiz right by. And I was fortunate enough to be able to ferret out a lot of these um, camping areas right next to amazing rivers like this. Um, a lot of these rivers, a lot of these campgrounds were, uh, you know, they, they certainly weren't in state parks. They might be in city parks or county parks. And there's an incredible wealth of uh, interesting places to, to see in those locally owned uh, parks. Now, um, I was fortunate to connect, at least in a small way, uh, with some of the Native American uh, themes uh, throughout the country. And um, this was, I think, it uh, really drove home, you know, that Native Americans are alive and well in the U.S. and that, you know, they have a really uh, remarkable uh, imprint on our culture. And um, even in the Eastern U.S., places like uh, Seneca, New York, um, where it was very heartening to see the, uh, the presence and the imprint of, uh, of Native Americans there. I learned, for example, that the uh, Meskwaki tribe in Iowa is the only federally recognized tribe in that state. Um, and um, it was quite interesting to see how in many cases, um, uh, Native American uh, institutions such as uh, stores and other places were taking the COVID epidemic, you know, much more seriously, I would say, than uh, other institutions in the same area. Uh, since we know that uh, COVID uh, disproportionately affects um, Native Americans and people of color. I had the good opportunity to stop, to uh, stay over with my former postdoc, Sangi Lamachini, who's now an assistant professor at Kent State University. And, you know, it just reminded me how America, I know this sounds trite, but America truly is uh, still a land of opportunity. Um, and uh, perhaps more importantly, how we as a country really are a country of immigrants. Um, you know, most of us, I think all of us can rightfully consider ourselves immigrants to this country. Uh, and Sangeet's story is a classic story of working hard, uh, applying oneself, and, uh, you know, uh, rising up the ladder, if you will. And, you know, the community where he's living in Streetsboro, Ohio, uh, is, you can see on the right, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm not so much in favor of these sort of sprawling uh, suburban um, enclaves. And yet, you know, for Sangi, this represents a true, um, you know, to buy a house is a true landmark. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited for him and his family. I passed through many, many small towns, most of which I'd never heard of. Um, and some of them were thriving, which was really exciting to see. For example, you can see in uh, the lower row in Winona, Illinois, um, this uh, gentleman uh, lovingly restored an 1860s era schoolhouse, which um, you can see on the lower left. And um, which is just, uh, you know, it's a real focus of uh, uh, school children come as far as Chicago to see it. And, um, you know, he was able to raise some money locally to do it. And it just showed how local um, efforts can really, really improve the environment uh, of a given town. Lots of great um, art and uh, murals, such as you see in, in Norwalk, Norwalk, Ohio. 
However, some towns that I passed through, um, you know, clearly were on hard times. And uh, talking with the locals convinced me that, you know, we were witnessing in many cases the inexorable changing of lifestyles that occurs um, because of change. The uh, food mart in Odell, Illinois there outwardly looked very healthy, but in fact was closed due to, um, partly due to the COVID epidemic and due to larger stores uh, propping up in the, in the nearby areas. Uh, and this town of Arvada, Wyoming, I had a very, um, very uh, touching conversation with uh, individuals who were lamenting the um, decline of the coal industry. Now, I, I know that, uh, you know, for many of us, uh, coal is uh, something that, um, you know, should be on its way out, and I heartily agree. At the same time, uh, it was, um, you know, it stopped me in my tracks to see the reaction of people whose lives were being changed uh, as a result of this, uh, our changing over to uh, clean technologies. <clears throat> and lots of evidence of clean technologies there was, um, just huge acres and acres of um, wind uh, mills running uh, all through the Midwest. Uh, and yet this sometimes against the backdrop of um, huge amounts of infrastructure uh, that we see, um, especially with regard to uh, coal on the one hand, which you see in the uh, train in the bottom uh, row, but also in terms of agriculture. Um, you know, the infrastructure for agriculture in uh, our country is staggering. And um, it was real eye-opener for me to see the, the scale on which agriculture is um, deployed. And so, you know, huge grain silos such as you see here, um, other kinds of infrastructures, um, and just um, aspects of agriculture that, you know, as a, a city boy, really someone who grew up in the city, were really eye-opening to me. So for example, I finally figured out why, how it was that these uh, suspicious cylindrical bales of hay were formed. Um, you know, it's something you see on the landscape. We had, uh, where did they come from? They probably come from outer space. Well, uh, this gentleman here is tight enough to uh, spend a few moments with me to actually explain uh, what he was doing and how he was doing it. Um, and also, just an example of, you know, grains moving into different uh, locations, just the scale on which our agricultural infrastructure uh, in this country is really, really remarkable. Um, and so, it was a great opportunity, a great education in um, just how the huge imprint of agriculture on our landscape. Now for the evolutionary biologists in the audience, uh, you'll um, appreciate that I went out of my way about 30 miles to visit Galesburg, Illinois, which was the birthplace of evolutionary biologist Sewell Wright, who of course was a famous uh, population geneticist back in the 1930s. Um, I can say, however, that uh, Sewell Wright is nowhere close to uh, being as famous as uh, Carl Sandburg, who was also born in Galesburg. And uh, you're, you know, you're greeted by signs pointing you to Carl Sandburg's house uh, as you enter town, whereas uh, Sewell actually is not even commemorated. It's really his father, Philip Greenwright, whose house is uh, commemorated here uh, and who helped uh, Carl Sandburg publish uh, some of his poems. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, Lewis and Clark was uh, a constant backdrop to um, my journeys, especially out west. And um, it was really uh, just a great, it really drove home how arduous their journey must have been. Um, I mean, here I was on my bicycle, every, able to cover, cover you know, up to 60 or sometimes 70 miles a day. And yet, uh, especially going up river along the Missouri, um, and just through all the challenges uh, uh, they encountered, it's, it's, you know, one of the most remarkable expeditions, uh, not only in U.S. history, but in, in world history, I would argue. 
And I would particularly recommend this Missouri Headwaters State Park, which you see on the upper right. Um, this is the place where you're not coming mu so much to the headwaters of the Missouri, but um, more to where the Missouri is, for is formed by the confluence of three rivers, the Jefferson, the Gallatin, and the Madison River. And uh, it's an extremely uh, peaceful spot, it's extremely scenic. Um, and uh, a great, one of these hidden gems that frankly I'd never heard of, uh, but was really glad to be able to spend some time with him. Now, I undertook this trip in early June and it had just been 10 days earlier or so that um, we had had the horrible um, murder of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis. And uh, we also had um, some unfortunate incident in Central Park uh, involving an African-American bird watcher, Chris, Christian Cooper, um, who was essentially, uh, you know, uh, verbally harassed and uh, assaulted by uh, a white lady who felt she was uh, being put upon by um, Chris's uh, uh, encouraging to, to put her dog on a leash, which was uh, in, in this particular part of Central Park was, was not legal. And so, uh, you know, these events certainly touched me, although I will say at the beginning of my trip, I, they certainly hadn't changed the tenor of my trip at all. However, about uh, really on my first day uh, of um, the journey, I was cycling through Nashua, New Hampshire, and I saw just right beside me as I was waiting at a stoplight, a white lady holding up a placard saying, we've been complacent too long. And this image of this uh, lady basically campaigning by herself uh, in Nashua, New Hampshire was extremely powerful for me, um, reminding me that we really, all of us have to chip in somehow. And so uh, that, and then also these very poignant reminders of uh, the ongoing uh, challenges, such as you see here, Black Lives Matter, these homemade signs, convinced me um, about three days into my journey to don, uh, to bedeck my bicycle with uh, some signs. And I was fortunate to uh, be staying with a um, lady who's a member of this organization called uh, uh, warmshowers.org. It's basically a cycling organization that uh, arranges homestays for you. And you know, this, this, this lady was remarkable because when I contacted her through the web platform of this organization, and she looked at my profile on the website, she immediately asked me, well, have you joined the Black Birders Week on Twitter? Now, you know, most people, uh, including myself, even a week earlier, had never heard of the Black Birders Week. Uh, and so I was really stunned that this lady would bring this up in the first place. And uh, it was that action that convinced me that she could, she had her stuff together. She was, you know, she was in tune, had her hand on the pulse of uh, what's going on. And more importantly, that she'd be able to put together within 24 hours of my arrival, uh, a series of signs that would be appropriate for me putting on my bicycle. So I actually put the grommets in these signs in her house in Schenectady, New York. And uh, at that point, my trip, took on a different tone. It wasn't, I would say, a tone of, um, you know, outright protest, or I certainly wasn't pulling into towns and organizing workshops to discuss uh, these pressing issues. But it did certainly cause people to turn their heads and in many cases started interesting conversations, which um, I otherwise would not have had. I also picked up two signs from the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which I, uh, uh, I didn't visit on this trip, but I, I serve on the board there and they're a wonderful organization. And uh, I, I, again, I told them, look, I need some snappy signs uh, with a bird theme that will uh, address the tenor of the moment. And you know, I really like what they put together. Um, this bird spark hope, I think, you know, you look at that and, it, I, I think most people get it, basically. They, they, they realize that, you know, our country needs a reason to be hopeful and that conserving our birds and other uh, wildlife uh, in a larger picture will give the country more hope. And this other sign, um, One Song, Many Voices, I 
didn't actually put on my bike for very much, although I did put it on, particularly on July 4th, as I was crossing appropriately the uh, Mississippi River. And um, for me, it definitely captures the, uh, the paradox and the joy, which is our country, which is, you know, having many, many different voices, hopefully going in the same direction. I made a lot of fun at myself on Twitter um, in this one, in this post, sort of making fun that I'm, at least the cows are listening to me because the truth of the matter was most of my days were spent um, far from people uh, and ideally far from cars. Um, uh, and so, you know, it looks, you can see the cows have their ears stuck out. And I will say that both horses and cows are incredibly attentive when you pass by. They were, they were locked on me as I was passing by. But more uh, importantly, um, it was very heartening to see, uh, you know, evidence of um, uh, support for the Black Lives Matter movement throughout my journey. I will say significantly more in uh, cities. Um, and, you know, uh, in many ways, arriving in Portland, Oregon was in many ways the, the, the uh, apogee in terms of uh, the activism, just because, um, you know, we had heard about all summer the uh, challenges and just the, uh, the real uh, challenges the city was going through. Um, and so to end there, to see these, uh, really to witness the rage that Portland was feeling at the time uh, was really um, exciting. I will say that, you know, not everyone believed in Black Lives Matter that I encountered. I encountered uh, people that said the movement was being funded by the Democrats. Um, these were often the same people that, you know, said that all of the bad press concerning, concerning the uh, spread of the COVID epidemic was an effort to undermine President Trump. Um, and I also met many people who, uh, you know, okay, Black Lives Matter, but then they would sort of come back somewhat pressingly, well, all lives matter. And I think, I think those of you who appreciate the Black Lives Matter movement will appreciate that we don't mean that other lives don't matter. Uh, what we do mean is that we're at a special place in time where uh, African Americans in particular are being uh, persecuted and that it's reasonable to, um, to stick up for this particular sector of the population. And the irony in many ways of my journey was the variety of perspectives I encountered. Um, most of them white, uh, I, you know, most of my travels were through very white parts of the country. Um, and to a person, people were incredibly generous, um, looked, giving me places to stay, um, giving me food, water, I mean, crazy generous stuff happening to me almost daily, um, while at the same time um, rejecting fairly vehemently in some cases uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, primarily I suspect because their prime encounter with it was through the television. Most of these individuals probably don't interact with African Americans much, if at all. Um, and as a result, in many cases, the conversation wended its way towards African American issues, not because I brought them up, but because, uh, you know, I was a novelty for many of these uh, communities. And I suspect that many individuals just simply didn't know what to talk about except for black issues. And so some individuals tried to convince me how important the Republican party was for uh, the success of African Americans. Others tried to, uh, convinced me, as I said before, that the Black Lives Matter movement was funded by uh, Democrats. Uh, Lenny here, which you see here in Roosevelt, uh, Washington, was frankly the only African American I encountered and had a substantive conversation with during the entire journey. And, uh, you know, I sort of asked him, well, you know, how do you, how do you manage here? You know, I, his community was surrounded by a uh, sign supporting uh, Trump. And, uh, you know, he gave me one of these uh, knowing looks that I've seen, you know, from many African Americans basically saying, hey, I know how to deal with this. And, um, you know, it, it is challenging sometimes, but uh, he, he was a bleeding heart Democrat to the core, um, as was uh, 
this individual on the bottom from the Crow uh, Indian Reservation from Wyola, Montana, he was, uh, you know, Native American perceptions of the Black Lives Movement are varied as we might expect for any group. Um, but um, Simon here was uh, totally behind it. He knew that any advances made by uh, people of color outside the Native American communities could only be of help to Native Americans themselves. And so, um, but on the other hand, this uh, couple in Portland, Oregon, which you see in the lower right, their store in downtown Portland had been looted by um, rioters associated with, or at least participating in, um, or perhaps infiltrating, who knows, the uh, Black Lives Matter protests. And one can certainly understand one's hesitancy if your own property had been damaged. So all kinds of uh, perspectives from different um, arenas. I thought I would just end um, by uh, playing you a few vignettes. Uh, give me a signal if I'm running uh, over at all. But I uh, just want to end with a couple musical interludes. Uh, music was very important to me and I think helped me get over a lot of those hills. In the morning, I would often play uh, something really mellow. Those of you who know me know that my uh, musical tastes have not evolved since about 1970, so forgive me. But uh, by the middle of the day, I'd be a little more uh, upbeat. And when times were really getting rough and I needed a pickup, either because the trucks were too uh, close or the hills were too hard, I would just turn, ramp it up a bit with some harder stuff. see me on Sunset Beach having finished my journey and obviously very excited. Um, I got lots of advice before, during, and after the trip. Here are some of my most useful uh, pieces of advice. Um, I always had to remind myself to enjoy myself and not uh, worry too much about getting where you're going. Uh, and in particular, not to focus on the end point, but just to uh, enjoy each, each day. And uh, I will say I, I've changed my diet completely. I, 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 was, I lost 25 pounds and I'm eating lots more healthy stuff now. And finally, I've got a great reading list as a result of um, my journey. And here are some of the birds, which uh, some of the books, which I'm uh, hoping to, uh, to read in the next few months. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Scott. That was fantastic. Really, really great. Um, we have a bunch of questions, so let's let's get right back right into them. Um, I should introduce myself real quick. I'm I'm Dave Skelly. I'm director of the Peabody Museum, and this talk has been sponsored by uh, the Yale Institute of Biospheric Studies and, and the museum. All right. So first question, uh, Making Cows asks. Uh, I'm asking this from the perspective of a cyclist and someone who loves nature. How did you choose your route across the country? I mean, I basically, um, I, I wanted to start close to home. My initial plan was actually to fly to the West Coast and then bike east. 
and uh, you know, uh, the the only the downside of that is I didn't have my family there when I was actually heading off. So I, you know, I started at the closest point to the ocean from my house, and then you know, I just uh, like I said, I used Google Apps for bikes to get to, for for areas where there were no published maps that I was aware of. Google Maps tended to put me on larger roads than I liked. Uh, and also there, there's plenty of errors in there leading me down blind alleys, which simply wouldn't work. Um, other than that, I did use those maps from the American Cycling Association, which are really, really excellent. Um, uh, they don't keep you entirely off the uh, bigger roads. They, they go there when they have to, but uh, there's lots of cool, they're, they're just excellent maps, lots of local information and, and lots of really nice tips about where to camp as well. That's great. Okay. Um, Barbara Andrews asked, uh, great talk. Thanks. Was there something that for you was the most surprising that you encountered? Oh boy. The most surprising. I mean, uh, you know, I could, I think, I think what maybe I would have to say is just how generous people were. I mean, I, routinely people would drive up in a car and specifically to catch up with me to give me a, a bottle of water or something like that. I had 52 foot trucks pull over to the side of the road. I, when, I, when I passed them, I thought they had a flat. And so here I was on my bicycle saying, you know, can I help you with this big truck? And, uh, but no, they had just stopped to say hello and to, to give me some water. And so I think when you're traveling alone, it tends to bring out um, the generosity in people. Um, and so, and, you know, I, I won't say I was necessarily surprised, but it was a really nice confirmation of um, just, you know, how generous people are uh, in this country. That's great. So uh, Shelly Altman says, great pictures and descriptions. I'm surprised to see no mask at all. Can you comment on that? And I, I noticed that as well. Were people just taking them off for the pictures or, or what was the story, Scott? Well, yeah, good, good question. I mean, most of most of the middle of our country, at least this summer, we're not wearing masks, especially in rural areas. You know, again, encountered several folks who basically felt that the COVID epidemic was um, was being manufactured by the press, and would point to statistics that they had seen showing that actually it's not the COVID epidemic which is causing increased deaths. Um, so you know, now. It'd be interesting to revisit some of those communities right now and hear what their story is, since we, we know it is increasing uh, in the West and Midwest. Um, I would I would always wear a mask going into a stores and stuff. Um, I didn't wear it when I was cycling. Um, and so, but honestly, not until I hit Washington State did I see the incidence of wearing masks just out in the community increase to any detectable degree. Um, most of the country and the smaller communities I was riding through weren't wearing masks. So I'm gonna combine- But as I said, for example, the, the Native, the stores that I went in, the Native American, the Native Americans were wearing masks. Um, I think the lackadaisical attitude was much more prevalent among um, other folks. That's interesting. So um, we're getting a, a bunch of questions around a similar theme, so I'm going to combine a few. Essentially, people are asking, um, do you think that um, your age and maybe your gender figured into how you were, you were treated? Do you think if you were younger or if you were a woman, would, would, it, would it have gone differently, do you think? You know, as a scientist, that's, uh, I always struggled with asking about causation on my trip. And, you know, of course, you've got to unreplicated experiment here. Um, I do know that for women who've bicycled solo across the country, it's a big deal. You know, it's, uh, you know, our country is, it's, it's simply not safe enough to um, take that sort of thing for granted. Um, I would, uh, you know, uh, the days of camping, for example, on the side of the road, just pulling over are over. I certainly didn't feel safe doing that myself. Um, and so um, I think that, as I said, uh, I, I truly believe I was a bit of a novelty for many of the communities I came through. You know, uh, these are places where they don't see African-Americans very often. And um, 
but at the same time, you know, they, it was clear that they didn't really care, uh, you know, that I was black. Um, and so it's, I would say a trip like this is certainly not for the faint of heart. It's, it's, you know, physically quite demanding and, and psychologically quite demanding. Um, and I know that um, the few cyclists that I passed who inevitably were going west to east were, um, you know, they were, they were impressed, I guess, that I was trying it on my own, but yeah. So a uh, question, this is from Martha Munoz, who I think you know. Um, she says, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Now that you have conquered this bike route, what is, what's next? Where next? <laughs> Believe it or not, I've actually have been on my bicycle since coming back. I, I went through a period of denial for about a month and then I said, oh, got to get back on it. I mean, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I think it's not like I'm going to go. I was my, I know my lab was worried about like, I, I kind of kidded them. I said, oh, I'm next I'm going to bike across Asia or something. No, I don't think anything like that. Honestly, I, it, for me, a trip like this makes you appreciate things close to home so much more. And so I'm really enjoying just being home with my family now. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I do think bicycling is a great way to see new places. I mean, I'd love to do a little more cycling in Europe. It's just, it's a great way to, to connect with the country. And so I would really recommend it for anyone. Um, so we've got a question here from Allison Richard. Uh, Allison asks, or she says, what an amazing adventure. And she asks, what was the lowest moment that happened to you over the course of the trip? <laughs> oh, I mean, there were lots of moments when, frankly, I didn't know where I was and it was hard to figure out which direction to go. And, you know, I had one low moment in Illinois when a lady, I asked if I could camp in a lady's property. I mean, this was a huge ranch with acres and acres of corn. And uh, she actually turned me down, I think, because of the Black Lives Matter sign. She basically pointed to the sign. I shouldn't say I think. It was very clear. She basically pointed to the sign and said, not with, not with that sign on your bike. And so things like that were very dispiriting. Um, I was also, you know, when I realized I had bicycled 15 miles in the wrong direction in the, coming out of the Black Hills, that was tough, but you know, you, you kind of just work around it. And um, again, you can't take it all too seriously. I, at least, especially I, I, the issue with kind of racism, I think that is a problem, but certainly getting off route a few miles isn't a big deal. So. We have a question from uh, Tony Harp. Um, is there anything you would do differently? On the bike trip, um, uh, I'd probably just take it a little slower. You know, I had the looming semester, fall semester coming up. So it's not like I could enjoy, you know, spend a few days in places I really enjoyed. If I had to do it over, I would definitely try to work in some extra time there. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, I've got a, a long list of places I want to revisit. Uh, you know, places like uh, Missouri Headwaters State Park, which is uh, just amazing. Um, so I, I, I would certainly like, I'd love to go with someone. I think that would be fun. It's, uh, it's not like I'm a loner or anything. Um, I think going by yourself does, you know, gives you certain flexibility. But uh, on the other hand, you know, I would see amazing things every day and not being able to share that with someone right then was, was tough. So, um, yeah, that's how I'd probably do it differently that way. So we've, we've got a, a ton of questions in only a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm going to try to amalgamate a couple just to um, be able to address more people's questions before we have to cut it off. Um, a bunch of people are asking questions that I can kind of summarize and, and then add something to. So it, people are asking, did, did the journey change you somehow or, or your opinions? And, you know, when's the book coming out? I, yeah, I thought about a book. I think it'd be a lot of fun. If any of you guys have any advice or uh, connections with publishers, I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, you know, I think it changed me in the sense that I, I realized, at least for me, that the big divide in this country is not black versus white or, frankly, Democrat versus Republican. It's, it's rural versus urban. I think now 
those two other two variables map on very closely to rural versus urban. But I realized that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's you know, and I also thought to myself, like, when was the last time we had a president who came from farming country? Um, so I guess I would say that uh, it helped me understand a little bit better uh, some of the perspectives of folks in rural areas, some of the, um, you know, challenges of them, you know, relating essentially to what goes on in Washington. Um, but, uh, and as, in terms of me as a person, um, I, I've always tried to listen to people. I think it's an extremely important um, thing to do. And, you know, I met a lot of people on the road who did a lot of talking. I, I, I'm good at listening. You know, it's, it's incredible. Sometimes these rural communities, you just, they just turn it on. I've got a, they've got a willing ear to listen. Um, but, uh, I, you know, it just, I, I, I'm, I'm just very excited that I could take the opportunity to do this trip. And, um, you know, I realized how important, how essential uh, your community is for success. Um, it sort of re-emphasized re, uh, that important point. So um, we only have time for one more question, unfortunately, uh, Scott. Um, and this one seems a good one to end on. Uh, Rosalind Reeves asks, did your trip spark any new ornithological questions that you are now going to research? <laughs> Lots of really interesting questions about birds. I mean, for example, uh, if you look at the range of the uh, California scrub jay, which is sort of a coastal species, but it gets inland uh, in basically its range, in the uh, eastern edge of its range begins in central Washington. I want to know why its range ends there. I mean, there is no geographic barrier in that position. There's probably some subtle uh, climatic or vegetational or um, temperature or humidity gradient that it's responding to. But, um, you know, the changing uh, birdscape naturally raised questions about why species occur where they, where they do. And, and um, it's something that I've always been interested in, but I'm, I'm there's a lot of really cool questions right here in the United States, which uh, if I don't bring up, you know, formally, I'll certainly be thinking about in the back of my mind. Well, that's great, Scott. Um, let me thank you on behalf of uh, Michael Donahue and the Yibs community and, and certainly on behalf of the museum. This was fantastic. Really appreciate you taking the time. I was one of the people who followed you day by day and you've inspired me to get on my bike and think about a lot of the issues you brought up today um, in, in different ways. So I sure, I'm sure I speak with uh, all the hundreds of people who are on tonight um, and just saying thank you. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, right. thanks, Mike. Uh, thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.